Good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome from me and also on behalf of my core chairman, uh, Stefan Windecker. It's a great pleasure to share this early evening uh, session and to, to discuss with you this very important, very exciting topics on, on mitral and tricuspid regurgitation interventions, catheter-based interventions with a mitral clip, with a triclip. And then, of course, we're going to talk about uh, replacement with a tendine device. We have an esteemed panel uh, and they're all going to give, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure, wonderful presentations uh, on the given topics and I think with no further ado we should start with the first uh, speaker and this will be Stefan and he's going to talk about this huge experience with MitroClip worldwide. Please Stefan. So thank you, uh, Georg. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, I quickly will summarize uh, the evidence uh, that has accumulated with the MitraClip. As you are well aware, we are in a privileged situation where there are now three randomized clinical trials, one in primary MR, two in secondary MR, and in the interest of time, I will focus on the two trials that address the issue of mitral regurgitation in the setting of uh, left ventricular dysfunction. The first study that was uh, reported and conducted one year ago was MitraFR in about 300 uh, patients with a primary endpoint assessed at one year, comparing uh, the MitraClip versus a medical uh, therapy. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the two-year outcomes have been reported, and for the primary endpoint of all-cause death and rehospitalization, there were no significant differences throughout uh, two years. And if you look at the individual components, there is no difference as it relates to all-cause uh, death, and there are very small, non-significant differences differences as it relates to unplanned hospitalization. Interestingly, when the investigators did an, uh, uh, an endpoint assessment as used in the COAP trial, looking at the total number of hospitalizations for heart failure, which was exploratory, still this difference was not significant, but you do uh, have the impression that after one year, the curves uh, seem uh, to uh, separate in favor of uh, the MitraClip intervention group. The second uh, trial that was reported also so a year ago was the COAP trial, now double in size with uh, more than 600 uh, patients assessed at two years of uh, follow-up and also for a slightly different uh, primary uh, endpoint, which was actually all hospitalizations uh, within uh, uh, 24 months. Now the 24 month results have been reported uh, previously with a very large treatment effect and relative risk reduction of nearly 50%. And this difference has enlarged over the longer term follow-up up to three years now with number needed to treat of only uh, three. If you look at the endpoints as reported in the MITRE-FR, all-cause mortality and uh, heart failure hospitalization against a very strong treatment effect in relative risk reduction of 45% uh, percent at uh, two years and uh, um, even more pronounced 52% at three years, again with very low number needed to treat of 3.4. And finally, if you look at all-cause mortality mortality and large treatment uh, benefit and 38% relative risk reduction that is maintained throughout uh, three years with a number needed to treat of uh, 7.9. Now what is interesting, purely hypothesis uh, generating, nevertheless interesting to look at are the crossover patients that is after the two year endpoint had been reached, only if, uh, a few patients had crossed over, but after two years uh, uh, several patients crossed over a total of uh, 53. And if you look at the outcome of those patients and compare it with those uh, that were continued on medical uh, therapy alone, it's is interesting to see that in these patients that crossed over and you look then at the one-year follow-up outcome, there is uh, seems to be a benefit that uh, is replicated and somehow uh, similar to the intervention group. So in other words, even if these patients were treated late, at least in this observation, uh, it seemed that these patients uh, derived an important uh, benefit. Now there also has been a detailed echocardiographic uh, assessment and it, it's noteworthy that for all subgroups uh, that have been assessed, there was a consistent treatment uh, benefit in favor of uh, the uh, MitraClip intervention as compared to the medical therapy group. And what is also important is that actually the vast majority of patients had a very good outcome, not only after the procedure, but that was maintained uh, throughout one year and two years with far above 90 
75% of patients having absence of moderate or severe uh, mitral regurgitation. From a patient perspective, obviously uh, also important is the quality of life. And again, if you look at quality of life uh, parameters, we see an immediate uh, benefit after the procedure within one month that importantly is maintained uh, throughout uh, the follow-up uh, throughout uh, two uh, years with a vast majority of uh, patients uh, Im improving. So after the procedure, more than two-thirds of patients actually experience an improvement in symptomatology. Now, the trials have been extensively uh, compared in terms of inclusion, exclusion criteria. You, here you see an overview of MITRE FR and COAP, and there were many similarities, but there were also differences, and one uh, related to the heart failure severity, where patients with ACCHA stage D heart failure were excluded from inclusion into COAP, as well as patients with largely uh, uh, dilated ventricles with left ventricular and systolic dimension of more than uh, 70. If you look at most of the baseline characteristics, there were actually not so uh, important differences. However, um, the mitral regurgitation severity assessed by the effective regurgitant orifice area was significantly larger by one third in coapt as compared uh, to mitral FR. And conversely, uh, the left ventricular and diastolic dimensions were smaller in coapt uh, as compared to mitral FR, indicating less dilated and diseased uh, ventricles. So if you put findings into perspective, looking at the impact of medical uh, therapy uh, or CRT in patients with a cardiomyopathy, we are used to an important relative risk reduction in terms of uh, mortality with a number needed to treat uh, that is uh, very important uh, within a period that is comparable to what was investigated in uh, core. But if you look uh, at the treatment effect of uh, mitricrypt, then you see that this is certainly competitive and comparable with these very established heart failure uh, therapies. So I'm concluding uh, that uh, from uh, the pathophysiological understanding and the impaired prognosis that has been observed in patients with left ventricular cardiomyopathy and secondary mitral uh, regurgitation, we no longer can assume that it is an innocent uh, bystander, but uh, that, inter that, that there are several patients that benefit from an intervention with transcatheter edge to edge repair. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, we'll, we'll go on and we'll have a time for discussion after the third presentation. And uh, uh, Dr. von Badeleben is going to ask the question whether there is device enhancement which leads to expanded options. Please. Thank you very much, dear chairperson. Uh, I'd like to draw the attention if the slides are up. I don't see them yet. Can we get the slides now? Now we're on. Uh, to give you the data analysis and the first corner up analysis of the 1,000 plus patient global expand registry, I'm doing this on behalf of the expand re uh, investigators as well as of the two PIs, which is Francesco Maisano and Saibel Carr. These are my conflicts. So in 2018, the third generation of MitraClip, which was the NTR and XTR systems, had been clinically introduced. And the EXPAND study was set up to generate contemporary real-world clinical evidence associated with these next-generation CLIP systems, both in the United States and in Europe. On the right-hand side, you can see the changes. It's uh, an arm width, which is extended by about five in angulated and six in the extended version. Um, of the arm length to support the leaflets uh, in mitral valve therapy. The design was a prospective multi-center single arm international post-market trial, real world in the United States and Europe. The um, goal was to include 1,000 consecutive consented subjects receiving the MitraClip NTR XTR with core lab analysis at 60 sites worldwide. The follow up was at baseline discharge one month, six months, and 12 months. And the key outcome measures were MR severity and major adverse events as very usual MACE uh, and VAR criteria. There was a clinical events committee that was utilized for the adjudication of a diverse events and also a central echocardiographic core lab that analyzed all data. 
So here, my primary objective is to evaluate and report on the first 30-day clinical outcomes with the full cohort of uh, 1,040 patients. So the overall study population included 1,041 subjects that uh, consented and underwent the MitraClip implantations. Uh, you can see that uh, there was an in-hospital death rate of 0.9%. 1,026 subjects could be discharged, uh, and 90, uh, 940 subjects subjects were available for the one-month follow-up. The demographics of the whole cohort, uh, typical patient age, which was 77 years in mean, a male predominance of 55%. The Euroscore 2 was highly elevated with 8.1%. You see the typical atrial fibrillation rate of 59%, and also prior heart failure hospitalizations within one year of 43.7%, which is pretty much in line with the co-op data and also the rate of prior myocardial infarction infarction. The baseline um, characteristics included a permanent pacemaker situation of 16%, cardiac resynchronization therapy, you have to take in mind that it's primary and secondary MR in this cohort, as well as an elevated number of primary valve procedures in these patients, ranging up to 15% of the total cohort, as well as prior coronary revascularization in 43% of all uh, patients in the cohort. So you see the uh, introduction of patients from the EMEA, which was uh, in Europe, uh, 621 patients. Uh, the US contributed uh, 420 patients. And according uh, to the FDA approvals at that time, uh, when the study was started, uh, you can see a predominance of the primary MR being enrolled in the United States, while the predominance of secondary MR was contributed by the European Union. Uh, if we look Look on the right-hand side of the table, we see an effective regurgitation orifice area that was larger in the primary group with 0.64 and was between the co-apt and the uh, mitra FR group, nearer to the co-op group with 0.39. These were self-reported data from the centers. Uh, the adjudication by the co-lab in this regard is pending. The mitral valve areas were typical, 4.2 centimeters in both regards, and you can see that the left ventricular ejection fraction as thought for primary MR was preserved with 56%, while the secondary MR group was uh, reduced with 36.5%, which is higher uh, than seen in the, both the co-opt and the mitra FR group. Um, looking into the data by clip use, you can see that uh, in primary MR, the rate of XTR, the large clip use, uh, was elevated, as well as the double use of hybrid procedures between the XTR and the NTR, while in secondary MR, the predominant system used was the NTR system. You can also see this in the clip size used by number of clips, so if only one clip was used, there was a predominance of uh, XTR use while it, when you use more clips, uh, also NTR has been used or hybrid procedures. Looking into the procedural outcomes, they were quite favorable. The overall implant rate reached almost 99%. The acute procedural success rate to reduce MR was 92.9%, so almost 93%, very much in range of the uh, co-op trial. And you can also see that compared to the Everest 2 trial that was raised by Stefan Windecker, uh, we could also see that the fluoroscopy time that was 43 minutes at uh, the early studies now is reduced in mitroclip procedures down to 17 minutes, as well as the procedure time that is below one and a half hours. The length of stay in hospital was very short with a mean of five days uh, for those patients. If we look into the use of the uh, mitral uh, gradients as well as the use model of one clip only, you can again see that in XCR only, uh, the number of one clip cases was highest with 68%. Uh, and typically, of course, in hybrid cases, uh, both clip systems, but also two different clip systems had been used in this study cohort. You can also see that either use didn't 
didn't produce any high gradients, which is given in the first uh, two uh, rows, and you can see that the gradient in XTR use increased to a mean of 3.22. In NTR, perhaps by using more clips, it was 3.5, and in hybrid procedures, it was 3.6 in mean. Uh, what is uh, astonishing is the very favorable rate of all-cause death at 30 days. It's 1.5. Uh, you can also see that there was, of course, no myocardial infarction at the leaflet therapy. Stroke rate was favorably low in these real-world uh, uh, data with 0.6. And also the rate of non-elective cardiovascular surgery was far below the uh, Everest 2 trial with 0.5%. Looking on the procedural learning curve, of course, the NTR system was very similar to the NT system that was introduced before, so there was no significant learning curve on the right-hand side. You could see that there was a very short learning curve uh, for the centers with the new XTR systems with the longer arms, meaning more rotational displacement uh, of the uh, clip ends, and you could see that there was also non-significant trend um, to a learning curve with less uh, proportion of pa uh, patients experiencing leaflet damage or SLDA. So one of the important parameters that was changed is a different grasping technique. So to um, um, allocate the longer clip arm length, it is very important to keep the tip of the clip within the annular level or to the ventricular side. You can see that on the other hand, because the clip arm is 1.2 centimeter, if you elevate this in the annular level, you will also raise the leaflets above the annular level to the LA. So a very important topic to actually support support the weaker leaflet and also to go slightly, which is about four millimeters, five millimeters, into the ventricle while closing with this larger clip system. Looking on the site reported MR severity, these data was also very favorable. We see an overall reduction to a grade 0 to 2 plus in 90% in primary MR, in 96% in secondary MR with the use of both clip systems, and in mixed etiology, 97%. I think this is very favorable data. And also the functional improvement increased the baseline of New York Heart Association Clause 1 and 2 from 21.5% to 80.5%. 2% and also the KCCQ score, which becomes relevant at about a range of eight points, increased by 19.3 points, which is um, uh, severely significant. So just two slides on the XTR and NTR use based on the echo collab assessment. I just want to give you the mean uh, left ventricular and diastolic volume index, which is in the range of the co-op trial. So it was 98 milliliters per meter square, so well below the mitre FR values, and you can see that in degenerative disease, these values were even lower with 66 milliliters per meter square. You could also see that the prolapse gaps was more, um, more treated with the XTR system, which makes sense because there's excessive tissue as well as flail gaps, while there was no change between uh, both systems in cooptation depth use, cooptation length, and tenting area. So for these anatomic considerations, more severe MR, larger ventricles, larger valve anatomies meant more use of XTR, while secondary MR, as well as smaller valve annular dimensions predominantly meant an NTR use model. To conclude, the expense study, as shown, confirms the safety and effectiveness of the next generation MitraClip NTR XTR system in a real world cohort. There was a learning curve to be seen with the new system, which was very short for SLDA and leaflet here, which was the first five cases. And XCR was more often used in primary MR in subjects with larger gaps, while left ventricular volumes were to resemble to the co-op subjects rather than the mitre FR subjects. So there was a difference of 37 cc per meter square. And this was independently assessed by the central echo collab. What is also seen that among all other studies so far, the Everest 2 Access EU registry, the German Trami registry with more than 1,000 patients, and the US TBT real world registry with 5.2 mortality rate at 30 days, the expand trial with 1.5% in high volume centers was very favorable both in the US and in Europe. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you, Stefan, for this excellent overview of the device we are currently using in clinical practice. And uh, that is a nice transition to the next presentation by Saibai Carr, who gives us a glimpse into the future. If there are any questions you want us to address to the panelists, uh, please uh, pr uh, post them on the uh, PCR React. Uh, yes. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for staying so late. Uh, the mitral club XTR and NTR has now become old news, with Gen 4 uh, out right now. So this is what the future, it's actually no more a future, it's actually reality. So these are the mitral club XTR uh, Gen 4. You can see that they're two NT, NT wide, XT and XT wide. Uh, so they, this is about six millimeters compared to four millimeter, and the lengths of each are the, identical to the XTR and NTR. In addition, they have a controlled grasping actuation, which means basically independent leaflet capture. You can also do a continuous left atrial pressure monitoring through the guide catheter, and the delivery system is actually a little bit more uh, controllable than the previous generation. The MitoCrypt Gen 4 is commercially available in the U.S., the first case being done on November 7th of this year, and its CA mark approval is pending. These are the characteristics, as I told you, it's about 50% wider than the previous uh, arms. So this is the case demographics of the first patient, a 77-year-old lady. She was a Jehovah's Witness. She had shortness of breath for one year. She had moderate renal dysfunction, and she had moderate mitral annular calcification. This is what her morphology looks like. What is very characteristic that she has degenerative MR, but LV dysfunction, and this is usually a bad sign, which usually tells you that this is long, long-standing degenerative MR. And you can see over here, in addition to the degenerative MR, she also has a significant mitral annular calcification, but her flail is just restricted to the P2 segment. She was therefore considered after discussion with our cardiac surgeon, Dr. Greg Fontana, we both agreed that this would be a reasonable option because we thought that she could get a surgical result, especially with the new generation mitral clip. And we decided based on the size of the leaflets and the width that we would just start with an XT wide. So we decided to use an XT wide for this patient. And this is the explained by commercial view demonstrating clearly over here a flail P2, and which is very well here. Then the gap doesn't seem to be too large, but the length of the posterior leaflet is adequate for an XT. Uh, this is just the uh, for, uh, LVOT view showing a, 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 a clearly a wall hugging severe MR jet. Uh, this is the Placement, what I want to show you is the independent gripper. So we basically, you have to test which side is anterior, which side is posterior. And then once we did that, you advance the clip system by closing it to 60 degrees, and then you advance in the ventricle, and then you reassess the orientation below the valve, and then you grasp the leaflets, and we can see here with the leaflets were grasped easily without the need for independent grasping. And then most important is after grasping the leaflets, you check the orientation again after the leaflets are grasped without closing the clip, and then gradually closing the clip. You can see this is a not reduction of MR. We would probably call it disappearance of MR. What you do notice over here that the LV function suddenly goes down uh, with a dramatic reduction of MR, and you can see the smoke and the scary smoke in the left atrium in the atrial appendage, all suggestive of a sudden reduction, a complete reduction of MR, a slight worsening of the LV function, and then, of course, the, <clears throat> the smoke, which usually goes away with the heparin. Uh, the patient went home the next morning. This is the creation of a tissue bridge you can see over here, a very nice tissue bridge with the single XT, and the gradient was only one millimeter of mercury. Uh, I also want to add this one, and this is what it looks like. You should notice that the slightly wider arm over here, you can see the little bump, and that's the widen, uh, extra widening, making it six millimeters long. The use of the MitoCrypt G4 NTW was also on the same day, and I just want to show just a characteristic as the use of the independent gripper function. And you can see over here, what happened is we were not getting a great result, and so what we did is we opened, gradually retracted only the uh, clip, clip attached to the posterior leaflet, and, and whereas the anterior leaflet was kept down. And what you notice over here is the posterior leaflet, the rolling in, in of the leaflet. 
And so what we did was we advanced the clip system, released the posterior leaflet, and then uh, pulled it out, retracted back. And now you can see that the posterior leaflet is resting more normally and not rolled in. And once we achieved that, uh, when we decided to then to drop the grippers, uh, how do you do that? And you can see over here, sorry, before that, I just want to show this phenomena, which you're dropping the grippers. Sorry. Okay. Uh, you can see over here, we've dropped the grippers and the leaflets have grasped, and you can see, as expected, the grippers are moving with the leaflet motion, but the, but the leaflets are clearly grasped, and then we close the clip. And then what you see over here, the leaflets are grabbed, but what you see is with just a single NT, there's a wide bridge, much wider than what we would get with a single NT normal one. But this is the NT wide, and the gradient was only two millimeters, and this patient actually had bileaflet prolapse with a large jet and was actually fixed with just a single clip. And this is the first generation, our celebration. You can see a lot of people from Abbott Vascular over here. You can see Dr. Vishwa there, Greg Fontana, and the, the ECHO team. And this is all Abbott Vascular over here enjoying themselves. And this is thank you to Dr. Dave, Fontana, Gabriel, and all the staff in Abbott Vascular. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, Cyber, let's have a short uh, discussion and uh, perhaps we start uh, not with the device, uh, but first uh, with the two studies uh, that were presented uh, last year and we can have a perspective from both the US and uh, Europe. Uh, what has been the impact uh, of MITRE-FR and COAPT in uh, your practice in Germany and uh, the US? And has it changed since uh, the um, additional data were reported two years for my 2 fr and three years for, for COAP. Saibar, do you want to start? Well, um, I'm going to speak for the U.S. perspective. Uh, the COAP trial was actually taken with a tremendous amount of success in the U.S. And even though we do not have reimbursement yet, we actually have an FDA approval of functional MRI. If actually, the indication is pretty strong. It says it's indicated for patients with significant functional MR in heart failure who are well managed with GDMT, the ejection fraction between 20 and 50%, and the ventricle size less than seven. And irrespective of the surgical risk, nothing was mentioned about a surgical risk. So these patients with the heart failure. So that means it's good. We are waiting uh, Medicare approval, which I think will actually escalate the uh, numbers of microgrips used in the US. And the mitofrance, um, we prefer that France, actually, we're good about making the wines over there. We'll still buy the wines from France. Any uh, comments from the panel? P uh, p so actually, um, for us or from, for me, it doesn't really change my decision, to be honest. Uh, so um, because we are so focused on mortality and rehospitalization, we always forgot about uh, life quality. And uh, I think, you know, um, if we really have a severe marginal regurgitation, I think it should be uh, treated, so. And, and maybe it also seems that um, in, in general we, we apparently tend to, to treat these patients with FMR a little bit earlier. And if you see the, the size of the LV in the expand registry, that's a co -op size of an LV, not of an, a mitre um, FR size. So I think many of us um, treating them at the, at the right time with, with FMR and not as late maybe as seen in my FR. But uh, maybe I can ask a question. We have now this notion that uh, if a patient is referred with a l large ventricle, and uh, let's say severe MR, we may defer this patient because we have this mitre FR patients. I'm, I'm in doubt of this because if you look at the, uh, for example, at the at the subgroup analysis in the in the COAP study, they all benefited, uh, irrespective of the fact whether they had a severe or, or a bit more moderate MR or a severely depressed left ventricular ejection fraction or not. So I, I'm totally with you. We are talking also about palliation, life quality, and maybe the panel could also comment on this. 
I, I totally agree. There has been a lot of discussion with the heart failure community, starting from the heart failure meeting in, in Athens this year. And I think uh, there has been a lot of misperception that uh, ROA is a clear cutoff value and that there is a difference between 0 0.39 and 0 0.41, uh, which is not the case. It's not an ECG reading of a QRS width. Uh, so I totally agree. There will be an overlap of outcome influence, which will be smaller ventricles in most cases, and also symptomatic relief, which has also been shown by Jörg actually in the Euro SMR uh, registry, where we also took part, that there in 1,000 patients actually, there is not this clear-cut difference uh, that it could pinpoint. So I think the, the publication by Grayburn has also not been correctly interpreted uh, in, in a number of patients. It only affects patients with regurgitation fraction of 50% and an ejection fraction of 30. And it, the linear curve that's given there doesn't mean it's a red below and it's a green above. So there is a transition period, in my opinion. Very important point. And I also believe that all this heart failure patient, they have most of the time a low blood pressure. And actually, if we also do our diagnostics, I think we sometimes underestimate the MR. And if we really would stress them, uh, I think really um, you really can see the real MR. And then I think that we most of the time really underestimate uh, the heart failure patients. So which patient uh, would you put on a stress, uh, on an exercise uh, examination? Patients that are very symptomatic. So they're really... Um, a New York Heart uh, Association 3, 4, and uh, I mean, you all had all the oral medication. They're fully treated, conservative, and uh, definitely, and then the, the TEE says like a moderate um, okay. MR, I definitely would go and stress the patient. Okay, good, good point. So maybe we can address quickly the, the devices that we have currently and then the novel devices uh, you, you uh, presented to us, Saibal. So they are available for you in the US under which circumstances? Um, well, it's commercially available now, but they've done a limited market release. So it's the first 20, there'll be 20 sites. And what we're going to do is collect data as to when we should use what clip. So we've come with an algorithm as to where we should suggest what sizes. And then we're going to test that hypothesis. And after 20 sites and analysis for a few months, then we will, they will, Abbott will decide to give it to a larger scale of patients in the US. And, that, and hopefully by then you'll get it in Europe. And that algorithm is already available or you are working on that algorithm? We're just working on it right now. Can you share that a little bit with us? Yeah, uh, so we basically, uh, Paul was there actually with us uh, making this step. So we basically took into consideration three factors. One is leaflet length, second is uh, mitral valve orifice, and third is the width of MR. And based on this, if we think that the leaflet length is adequate, it means greater than 10, then we would consider starting with an XT, and if this is with XT, XTW, if the mitral valve area is adequate, more four or more, then we might, the thing would be an XTW wide. If it's a functional MR, or posterior leaflet is small, or the valve area is smaller, then you would start with the NT or NTW. So that's just like the basic summary of it. So do the Europeans agree to that? Well, at least we, we don't have any experience yet, but we were part of that decision making on, on actually um, just was yesterday. They? Yeah, but, but we are very keen to, to, to see these early results with the clip, and I hope that we will get the CE mark approval very, very soon. I think it's good to have many options, but I think two many options it's also a problem you know so then you are an operator and you're like not really satisfied with your result what what are you doing taking it out and taking another one in and let's try and try an arrow so i think you know four sizes is good enough and uh, i wouldn't go for more and more and more and just you know to be more focused what what we want so what is going to happen is that there are four sizes available. So the, obviously in the next five, six months, we'll have an idea as to what is being used. For example, let's say we find out that uh, XT, just XT, not XTW, is not used at all in 90% of cases not. Then probably it will be removed and we'll just have three sizes. So. But he, uh, here I have another question. If, you, if you're placing one, uh, no matter which clip, we're talking about the mitral space and with the first clip you're not satisfied at all you have the enemies on both sides on the medial and the lateral size 
Uh, and now we're going to have this tendine session in a, in a few minutes from now. How, how is your decision making nowadays? Would you put out the clit totally and, and give the patient another chance for a different device? Or what is your, what is your decision making? So I think this is a great question because with the availability of transcatheter mitral valve replacement and potentially available CMARC, uh, our threshold for treatment is going to change. So we're not going to, if we think that this clip is, or the Pascal, whatever it is, will not give you a reasonable result, then you should think twice whether you should leave behind a clip. Uh, having said that, there are also technologies being developed right now, and there's actually a paper that was published see, recently, actually not published, it was actually presented, of actually removing the clip and actually putting a valve in. So there's going to be all these technologies developed for actually cutting off the uh, clip from the posterior leaflet and then putting a valve in. And I think, uh, Paul, you did a case, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll show that in a little bit. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we have to move on. Uh, great discussion. Um, yeah. We go to an even more exciting space, the tricuspid uh, space, and the first uh, kickoff will be done by Professor Hausleiter, and he's going to ask a question, why should we treat tricuspid regurgitation with a transcatheter approach? Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is a good question. Why should we treat the tricuspid regurgitation with a triclip? And I'm going to repeat this question several times. Um, so um, why should we treat those patients? Because those patients are highly symptomatic. You know this image from the Netter uh, book. Um, and these patients with tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure are very symptomatic with dyspnea, abdominal pain, peripheral edema, ascites, exhaustion, and weight gain. Why should we treat those patients? Because they, are high, um, because they have a high mortality, and mortality is increasing with each degree of, um, of tricuspid regurgitation. Well, why should we treat those patients? Because if we look at the surgical mortality for isolated tricuspid repair, this is very high, and there's a nice publication out from last year from La Par when they tried to develop a dedicated risk score for assessing tricuspid surgical risk. And um, if you look at this table from the multivariable analysis, and we just pick three typical parameters, a patient above 70, a female patient, and she is symptomatic with neurocard class 3. We are not considering previous surgeries, stroke, hemodialysis, or lung disease. Just these three parameters, we get a risk score of 6. And in this analysis, a risk score of 6 translates into a mortality rate of 10% and a morbidity almost of 40%. Why should we treat tricuspid regurgitation with a triclip? Because the triclip pr procedure is very, very safe. And this has been shown very nicely in the Triluminate trial, just published very recently by our chairman um, last week in The Lancet, demonstrating that in, in the Triluminate trial, at six months, only 3.7% of, of patients experienced a major adverse event. Very sick patients, but a very, very good safety profile of the, of the treatment. Why should we treat those patients with a tri triclip? Because the triclip results in a durable TR reduction, at least at, at midterm. And we have seen this in the tree valve registry, um, collected patients from, um, um, with, uh, treated with a tri with a, or with the mitoclip um, in off label patients and demonstrating a 72% reduction in a TR of one or two at follow-up. And this very same result has been duplicated in the triluminate trial, as you see on the right side, in this five grade uh, scale, a very good reduction also extending to six months. We don't have long-term follow-up, two, three, or four years, but I'm very confident that these nice results will be even durable for at a longer time. 
Why should we treat tricuspid regurgitation with the triglet? Because it improves cardiac output. And this is a study we performed with an, um, the, um, in our hospital with the cardiac output assessed by an inert gas rebreathing method. And you see that the cardiac output is increasing by around 20%. Why should we treat tricuspid regurgitation with the tricuspid? Because it results in a significant symptomatic improvement. This has been shown in the treatment of registry. Again, 69% of patients were in neurocardiac class 1 or 2 at follow-up. And very comparable, we also see a very, very good and even a better result in the triluminate trial as shown on the right side. Why should we treat tricuspid regurgitation with the triclip? Because it results in an increased physical activity. We have seen this on the right side in the six-minute walk test with an increase of 20% in the six-minute walking distance. But also, if you do a more modern approach of assessing physical activity with the Fitbit approach, then we also see that the daily activity, the number of steps where the patient can walk at home increased by 25%. Why should we treat those patients with a triclip? Because it improves kidney and liver function. It's not getting normal, but those patients who have an impaired um, kidney and liver function do see some results, some benefits in terms of the GFR, the AST, or the drop in the bilirubin. Why should we treat TR with a triclip? Because it might improve survival in patients with isolated TR. This is also a study from Maurizio Taramasso from the tri registry comparing those patients um, who have been treated with the, with the, um, for the tricuspid regurgitation interventionally, comparing this to a historic control group. And we do see a significant improvement in terms of the survival free from heart failure hospitalizations and the overall um, um, survival. Finally, the triclip, might, the triclip might also improve the survival in patients who have combined diseases on the mitral side and the tricuspid side. We compared all here in this graph um, the data from the TRAMI registry where all the, all the patients with severe TR and severe MR were treated only on the mitral side. This is the survival curve in red. And we compared these patients to patients from the tree valve registry where both valves were treated with this at the same time. And you see that there might be also a survival benefit in those patients. So I have presented you a number of reasons why we should use the triclip to treat tricuspid regurgitation. However, um, we need further evidence um, from the triluminate pivotal trial, which is really highly needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jörg, for pointing to the rationale for doing the procedure. We continue with uh, Triluminate, and uh, Philipp uh, Lutz uh, will uh, tell us more about this. And after this, we will discuss a little bit more the tricuspid uh, intervention. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. It's uh, my pleasure to give an um, update or summary of the Triluminate trial. Um, these are my conflicts of interest, um, and I do have a little bit the problem that some of the slides were already shown in the previous talk, but I think the, the overall topic and the trial itself is exciting enough to allow a little bit of redundancy. Um, you've heard in the previous talk that tricuspid regurgitation is associated with a high rate of morbidity and mortality. We also know that the treatment for these patients um, up to now is, is pretty much limited and restricted to diuretics and high-risk surgical procedures. So a transcatheter approach for these patients appears very appealing and um, um, a valid option for these patients. The Triluminate trial was a trial to assess the um, feasibility to apply the mitral clip technique from the mitral side towards the tricuspid valve. The objective was to evaluate the safety and performance of a transcatheter tricuspid valve repair system in patients with moderate or greater tricuspid regurg and all patients were discussed by a heart team. This was a prospective single arm multicenter trial including um, 85 patients at 21 sites in US and Europe, echo core lab 
and clinical e events were um, adjudicated. The um, primary endpoint was um, um, the ability um, to reduce TR by at least one grade at 30 days and the safety a composite endpoint at six months. Um, patients were included when they were symptomatic with um, um, a set moderate or greater TR. Um, no other um, valve lesions needed treatment and excluded were those with um, um, severe pulmonary hypertension or severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Here you can see the baseline characteristics of 85 patients, mean age 77. There was a, um, um, a dominance of female patients. Um, two thirds were women in that trial, and this is fundamentally different to other valve trials, but what we um, actually have seen in, in almost any analysis of transcatheter techniques on the tricuspid side. One third had prior um, interventions on the mitral valve. That group was um, um, severely symptomatic with um, three um, quarters in NYHA class three or four. Left ventricular ejection fraction was preserved. And um, as you can see here from the six minute walk test, less than 300 meters. So these patients were clearly sick. The um, majority of clips were implanted um, into the anterior septal commissure between the anterior and septal leaflet, and 20% between posterior and septal, and then very few between anterior and posterior, and on average two clips were implanted with a high rate of implantation success and acute procedural success, as you can see here. The, um, Acute reduction in TR um, is uh, demonstrated here at 30 days, 57% had moderate or less tricuspid regurgitation. However, it is very important to realize here that yes, there are some patients with severe, but applying a five grade scheme means that there were some patients starting off with torrential TR and even though they were still at severe, they had two grade reduction of TR and on, um, in total 87% had a TR reduction of at least one grade and these resu results were well maintained at six months. Um, two hours ago, the one-year data of the first 50 patients um, were presented by Professor Nikinik, and here you can um, see the results again at one year that reduction was well maintained with 87% at one year still demonstrating a reduction in TR of at least one grade. The safety profile has been alluded to already, extremely safe in terms of the procedure. However, there were five deaths between 30 days and one year. These were not procedure or device related, um, but this highlights that obviously when we look at severe TR, we are dealing with a um, um, frail patient population at high risk. The reduction in TR was associated with a clear symptomatic improvement, and that was seen in those with obviously a very good result, but also in those where um, TR was only reduced to, to one um, grade. So and in, in all other studies, we've um, um, reproducibly seen um, marked improvement in symptoms, an improvement in quality of life assessed objectively with the KC, um, KCCQ score, improvement in six-minute walking test, and again, from baseline to one year, so this is not just an acute result, but it's maintained during follow-up. And, and this um, is, is very interesting, we do see a reduction in right ventricular size early, but then with a further reduction during follow-up for the right ventricle and the right atrium, su suggesting some positive remodeling, and then even an improvement in right ventricular function. Um, this is um, very interesting, which certainly needs um, confirmation in, in a larger number of patients, but so far we have no signal whatsoever that RV function goes down after treatment. I'd like to finish off with um, one of our patients that was the first patient we enrolled into Triluminate. That was a 70-year-old lady with um, long-standing AFib with dilatation of the right atrium with functional T. Uh, as you can see here, um, the fact that the um, right 
ventricular annulus was dilated is much better seen than on a transgastric view. You can see that the regurgitant jet extended from the anteroceptal commissure towards the center of the valve. And then this um, lady was treated with one clip between the antero and septal leaflet. And this is what it looks like after one year. We do have a smaller RV and we still have a very good result in that patient. And she, she is in NYHA class. Um, one at this point. So um, in that case, very satisfying. So in summary, we've seen durable repair, good reduction in TR, and this is um, maintained after one year with a very good safety profile. We see significant improvement in symptoms and a positive remodeling um, of the RV and improved function. This study shows that even although this is really early days and includes, um, includes a learning curve, the Clyde trip procedure is feasible, extremely safe, and effective in reducing TR. We see improvements in symptoms um, with almost any reduction in TR. Um, the initial results are well maintained during follow-up, and this is clearly time now to assess the potential of treating TR in a randomized controlled trial. This will be done, has already started in the triluminate pivotal study, which will be a landmark trial in this field, and um, obviously very important. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, certainly very interesting uh, data now on the tricuspid uh, side. Perhaps we can engage into this discussion and pick up uh, on your last point uh, that we create additional evidence. We know it works. Uh, you can do it per safely. It reduces uh, TR. So tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, pivotal uh, study, how patients are selected, which patient characteristics they, they need to fulfill, and uh, what kind of endpoints uh, you're looking at? Um, yes, so this um, study will um, look at patients who are um, who have a severe tricuspid regurgitation, who are at a, at a higher risk. Um, these patients will then be randomized um, either to um, transcatheter treatment or to medical therapy. Obviously, the, the interventional group also will get um, best medical um, therapy. Um, the um, com Bind endpoint includes mortality, rehospitalization, um, reintervention, and also changes in the quality of life. That's a hierarchical endpoint. Um, and then, this, then there will be um, a, a, um, another um, a third arm of patients um, in which um, TR is really torrential or massive and in whom the reduction might not be as successful. And these will be only treated um, with tr transcatheter but will not be randomized. We, we have seen a nice evolution in terms of uh, devices available on the mitral side. Uh, we see what will be available shortly uh, on the mitral side. Uh, do we have the right device for the tricuspid uh, and is that used in the pivotal study? It is. It, it is it's uh, it's going to be the NT system, uh, but it will also be NT and XT. So for the first time, uh, we'll be able to test the two different anatomical sizes uh, in a randomized fashion. And then Philip is right, there's a randomized arm and there's a non-randomized arm. And the distinction between those two arms is whether or not we feel as operators we can get the TR to moderate or less. So whether it's torrential or whether it's a pacemaker lead that's in interfering or there's some difficulty with regards to the imaging, those patients will go into the non-randomized cohort and then everyone else uh, will go into the randomized court, which I think we're all very eager to see uh, in terms of whether or not we really are doing the effect we think we are uh, with the therapy. So would you use NTR clips in the tricuspid space at all? I mean, question to all of you. N NTR, XTR? NTR. Yeah. Well, I think you know where I sit. <laughs> I think we've used both. Um, I know there's a tendency towards using XT. I actually don't know whether the XT wide will be allowed. No. Not, not right, yeah. Just okay. Which I think would be nice if we could use Gen 4. Uh, that's right? coming probably after Triluminate Pivotal, but uh, I think probably the majority will use the XTR um, because the experience what we have so far from the um, off-label use is that the leaflet grasping is a lot easier and that we even probably create a better co-optation of the leaflets which might at the end be uh, beneficial to the patient.
So if you, uh, we talked about this mitral and tricuspid by now. So if you have a patient with mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, which is a frequent, uh, frequent disease uh, happening concomitantly, what would you do with this patient? You mean for a steady enrollment? No, or for no, no. Uh, in, in the clinical scenario, you, you are faced by, by a patient with severe mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Yeah. He's not going to go to open heart surgery for right. due to comorbidities. So what would be your, your strategy? Well, uh, in the U.S., because we're trying to get patients into the pivotal, uh, we would try to treat the patient's mitral and then bring in that and enroll them 60 days after the mitral is addressed to be in the study where we can learn from uh, that, uh, that patient. If the patient would not be eligible, I think it would be a mistake to leave the TR alone. Uh, I think we, 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 we know from numerous studies that residual TR is even after a mitral clip is a very poor prognostic sign. The mortality is twice that of patients without severe TR left after mitral clips. So I, I don't think you can ignore it. And uh, be interesting to see how the practice over here changes uh, with, with the advent of Gen, Gen 4 and other tools that you can treat the tricuspid valve differently. Well, the, um, the nice thing is that we can um, treat those patients at two different time points. So we, we are not forced to treat them at the same time point. The only advantage is um, that those old and fragile patients do not have to come back if you really do this in one procedure. So you avoid a second anesthesia, a second hospital ad admission. So that might be beneficial and might, might be some argument for doing it concomitantly at the same time. Um, the procedure is not very much longer because the tricuspid uh, regurgitation can be treated probably in most experienced hands in, in about an hour. I, I think a strong point for a staged uh, um, procedural planning is that you can recompensate the patient easier, that the annular dimension may be smaller for the staged therapy of the tricuspic. We're not doing it a surgical procedure. We can easily stage these procedures. And a limited number of perhaps 20%, 30% may even get better um, after mitral uh, repair. So I would always stage those patients and wait two to three months before treating the tricuspic. But um, maybe to add that you shouldn't expect too much because we know from reports that one out of four patients really will end up with, um, with an improvement in TR after treating the mitral valve. So. Yeah, I actually agree with Stefan. Um, like two, three months waiting, see, and then stage-wise. So, but maybe we need to look at the surgical data looking at the um, annulus dilatation, if it's above four, then perhaps we should be more generous in, in treating that at the same time. At least that's what our surgical colleagues have told us so far. Any considerations regarding the imaging, mitral versus uh, tricuspid? Uh, are you satisfied with the transesophageal echo alone? I think there's I think there's clearly a learning curve uh, with it, uh, but we you know as a, as we have trained people up in the Charlemagne pivotal study, uh, we spend a lot of time on the imaging, and uh, even the most expert imagers learn something when they come, and so I think there's a very important learning curve about getting the transgastric views that we're not used to getting anymore uh, because we now have 3D to look at the mitral valve in other ways, and so. Uh, we all know with TR, it's very important to have those transgastric views. So when we have severe MR and TR, we actually evaluate the TR first because that helps drive a lot of decision making about whether we should offer transcatheter therapy. Any chance for ICE? Yeah, we, uh, we have used, we've used both two-dimensional and four-dimensional ICE. So there is, in the U.S., uh, the siemens Akunov volume is available, which is pretty similar in MPR to a TOE and has no artifacts coming from the right atrium. And you can simply puncture both femoral veins uh, and the 4D probe is just 12 French. So it's easy to place into the right atrium. You have no shadowing whatsoever. So this may be a very good option for those two to 5% where you may have impaired imaging. That means in technical aortic or mitral valve replacement or severe calcification. And there I would clearly opt for an ICE option in the future. I mean, having said that the new Philips Epic machine, uh, the new and the with the X8 probe, the images of the tricuspid are definitely much better. So you can get a, most of the cases just with them. 
I think we have to move on. Thank you very much. Um, and Paul, you are up now and giving us an update on the clinical program of the Tendine device, please. Thank you very much and uh, good evening to all of you and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It really is a pleasure uh, to be back here in London uh, as always. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an update on the Tendine uh, clinical program. And as many of you know, uh, the Tendine valve is a trileaflet uh, bioprosthetic valve. It has an outer and an inner frame, and the outer frame is configured anatomically with a broad range of sizes, and it helps isolate the function of the valve from the inner workings uh, with stability and um, sealing. The uh, valve itself is uh, stabilized by a tether and an apical pad, which helps promote hemostasis. And importantly, the entire prosthesis is fully retrievable and repositionable uh, during the procedure. And it does not uh, require any cardiopulmonary bypass or rapid pacing uh, when it is deployed. Like many TMVR technologies, we use CT to assess uh, the patients for tendine. We use uh, the CT to look at the mitral dimensions. We look at the LA and LV chambers. We look at the papillary muscles. We look at the LVOT to assess for the potential for uh, LVOT obstruction. And we also use fluoro to, uh, or CT to help guide the procedure in terms of the simulated uh, fluoroscopic uh, views. Now the Tendine comes in two uh, sizes. There is the standard, uh, which has an EOA of 3.2, and the low profile, which has an EOA of about 2.0. And here you can see these two prostheses overlay to show you how the low profile can give you a little bit bigger uh, LVOT for those patients who may be at risk for LVOT obstruction. So the procedure is performed with a transapical or transventricular approach. It's very important to start with access that is perpendicular to the planes of the mitral valve, both in the anterior, posterior, and in the CC dimension, because those planes and that angle of attack and, uh, determine your tether position, which determines how your hips of your valve are placed. So once we establish a cord-free path, you can see in the lower left-hand side, we advance the valve and rotate it to its anatomical configuration in the top middle here. And with the aorta on top, you can see the valve sits very well intraannular, and there's relief of MR. And then here in the lower right-hand side is a picture of the thoracotomy wound. And here you can see the valve's been fully deployed. And even at this point, it can be fully retrieved if so desired. Otherwise, this thoracotomy is then closed and the patient is recovered uh, in the ICU. Now, the uh, global feasibility study has been completed and we published uh, results in the first 100 patients earlier this year. Uh, average age was 75. Most patients were men. Most were class three. The STS was 7.9. Uh, about 60% of the patients were in the United States, 40% OUS. 90% of the patients were secondary, and 92% had grade four with a mean LVF of 46%. In these 100 patients, the valve was implanted in 97 uh, with technical, technical success in 96 of the patients. There are three patients in whom the procedure was aborted, one for LVT obstruction, one because of non-orthogonal access, and then there was one patient in whom the device was not attempted because there was pulmonary edema uh, during the procedure, uh, before as the procedure was getting started. Now the results of the Tendine procedure are really quite extraordinary. Uh, I do feel that this is a state-of-the-art TMVR prosthesis. You can see here, first 100 patients, and it continues to be the case, no procedural mortality no strokes, no emergency surgeries, no uh, ECMO required in any of these implants. And the reduction of the MR is quite extraordinary. If you look at the results here in green, you can see here 98.9% of the patients had no MR uh, at uh, pre-discharge echo. And this reduction in MR was sustained uh, out to one year. You can see here 98.4% in the patients who had one-year follow-up. So a very significant reduction that was sustained uh, throughout the follow-up in the study. And there's also corresponding improvements in NYHA functional class. You can see here, this is uh, NYHA class. Also uh, inserted are the patients in whom there was a uh, death. And then you can see here at the one-year follow-up, among the survivors, 88% of the patients were class one or two. And remember, over 92% of these patients were class three in the beginning. And so these improvements in symptoms were clinically significant. 
So overall, there's a high implant success rate, over 97%, low 30-day uh, mortality rates, low SAEs, no operative deaths, no emergency cardiac surgery. The 30-day mortality was 6%, and that's less than the expected. Uh, STS is 7.9%, stroke 1.3%, MR reduction 98% that was sustained, and a high rate of symptomatic improvement with 88% of the patients class 1 or 2. So the Tendine clinical experience continues to grow. The global feasibility study has now been completed, uh, or sorry, is, is almost uh, getting close to being completed. Uh, the summit uh, is the IDE pivotal study in the United States. Uh, the MAC trial was an EFS study and has now been rolled into the summit study as part of the pivotal examination. And over 280 patients have received the device uh, thus far. The summit trial is a U.S. pivotal trial. Uh, this is designed to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of Tendine in patients with severe symptomatic mitral regurgitation. The trial is being led by two PIs, Dr. Jason Rogers and Dr. Gaurav Alawadi, and the, the, the scope of this uh, trial is to focus on those with symptomatic MR with or without severe MAC. And there are three components. On the left-hand side, um, you can see there's a randomized arm for those patients in whom you can also do CLIP. So the tendon will be randomized against CLIP in that arm. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, there are two non-randomized cohorts, one for patients with severe MAC and one for patients without severe MAC who cannot be clipped. And I think these three different arms will help answer a number of different questions about the role of TMVR in our practice. Now, as we are enrolling in these studies, it is important to note that Tendine is being used in a variety of uh, anatomies out there. Some of uh, those anatomies are actually quite extreme. Uh, this is my patient here. You can see there was severe MR, and if you look on the lower left-hand side, there is severe mitral annual classification. We actually, uh, in a number of these cases, use a balloon uh, to prep the area to make sure that the valve will self-expand to preserve the inner function of the prosthesis. And with that, and with the deployment, you can see in the bottom uh, middle there, uh, there's complete relief of MR in this patient with severe MAC. And here's a post-procedure CT to show you how that valve sits very well uh, in that patient with severe MAC. And thus far, uh, we have treated 19 patients. Again, no operative mortality, no 30-day death, and complete relief of MR. And the first experience with, of this was published earlier this year uh, in JAK. Here's another example of how Tendine can be used. This has uh, been done in several cases around the world. This is a patient with a previous surgical ring, a 32 uh, memo, and you can see there's severe MR. Very similar, you can see the Tendine valve being extruded and rotated, leading to complete relief uh, there on the right-hand side uh, with the valve in place. And to Saibo's point earlier, uh, this is a, a patient of mine who we treated about one year ago. He was an 80-year-old man who had previously undergone transcatheter repair elsewhere. Uh, unfortunately, he had re severe recurrent MR and also heart failure. And one of the clips uh, had become detached as an SLDA. The other clip remained as a bridge. And there was mitral stenosis. The mean gradient was three. And he was not a surgical candidate. And he was also felt not to be a uh, candidate for a repeat clip based on his anatomy and the degree of stenosis. So this is a first in human experience, and this is using Tendine in a complementary fashion in a patient who had had previous transcatheter repair. And you can see in the top left-hand side, what we've done is we've done two transeptal punctures. A, a wire with a snare has been passed around the remaining tissue bridge. Uh, we then electrify that wire. You can look on the top, I'm sorry, bottom left-hand side. If you watch carefully, those two agilis catheters are being pulled. And as they're being pulled, the wire electric, electrical current is being turned on. Here it comes. You're going to see it pulled. There it is. And then that tissue bridge is cut. And then we then extrude the tendine valve, which you can see on the middle side, essentially pushing the clips to, to the side. And here in the top right, the tendine valve has been fully exposed, and there's been complete relief of MR. And since our, our first case here, this has been replicated in several other cases since. And it really does speak to the potential for complementary therapy uh, in these patients who may not benefit from repair. 
So in summary, uh, in terms of 10 and 10 9, there's a very high implant success rate, and no operative deaths, no cardiac surgery, sustained MR reduction with almost 100% relief in these patients, and it's being used in a broad range of anatomies with very complex disease being successfully treated, including those patients with severe MAC, previous surgical ring, and even those with previous transcatheter repair. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Paul. This was extremely interesting. Another example of electrosurgery in selected uh, cases. And we continue on the theme of the tendine valve. Uh, welcome Edith Lubos, who now goes into patients with prior aortic valve uh, intervention. Yeah, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, after these great cases from Paul, I really um, are yeah, grateful actually to also show some cases about transkeular mitral valve implantation with the tendons in patient with prior aortic valve uh, replacement. So these are my conflicts of interest. Um, actually, um, the, the TMVR is an essential tool, therapeutic tool for severe mitral regurgitation in patients under high surgical risk. And we have some technical issues. So the delivery, the sealing, the anchoring, and especially the LVUT obstruction. And patients that are prior with an aortic valve replacement have, of course, most of the time, or sometimes small ventricle, hypertrophy, and there is a high risk of LVUT obstruction. So when they started the tendine study, they were concerned, and there was a contraindication actually to include patients that have a, a aortic valve replacement. Because they were concerned about the interaction and especially about the LVUT obstruction. So I want to like to present you some cases. So in Hamburg at the university we are treated eight patients completely with a tendine. Five were in the study and three patients were actually compassionate use patients. And this one one of these were the 80 years old female and she received a Tavi Sapien 323 in 2016. And because of her comorbidities, she had a high surgical risk. The second patient was the 85 years old frail patient, also received in 2016 a Sapien 326 and had a really low e ejection fracture and uh, cardiovascular risk. As she also had a, uh, a tricuspid re uh, reconstruction, so she really also had a high risk. And the third one is an 84 years old patient who received in 2017 a core valve Evolute 20 and 9. So these are the echoes from the first case, and as you can see, there's a severe mitral regurgitation with an error of 0.27. There's a B leaflet tethering and a short PML, which was like around 4 millimeters, and a flail in the P2 segment. Severe TR at taps of 8 millimeters and an SPAP of 49 millimicrogram. The second patient also had like a very short PML, a severe MR, just mild TR, and the th third patient actually had like a calcified annulus, uh, so also actually a contraindication for a tendine uh, implantation. Um, so we performed like the pre-procedural scan, as Paul uh, demonstrated for all of the three cases. And uh, here we just want to show you especially um, the focus on the Neo-LVOT. And as you can see in the first case, it was 331. And the second case was kind of borderline and also like on the top because it's like the cutoff is 20, 250. Uh, 50 millimeter square. Here we had 250 millimeter square. Um, on the third patient, you really can nicely see the calcified mitral ring and also like a 3D demonstration how actually the tendine in a MAC position with the core valve can look like. So, and this is for, for systole and diastole, and also we always have to double check that the, really the new LVT area is not going below 250, and in all three cases actually was not the case. What you also look at the CT scan is the length of the EML. You can see the excess side, you kind of really can pre-procedural demonstrate what's gonna happen, what's not gonna happen. 
So this is actually the tendon implantation, which were performed in 2017. So on the left side, you really can see a severe marital regurgitation. You can see the sapien in place. And in the middle angiograph, you can really see the self-expanding tendon and uh, on the 3D echo. We implanted a 32.5 times 43.5 millimeter valve, and we had a cardiac output which was increasing from 1.8 to 2.4. The second case uh, was uh, the 85 years old female, and as you really can see, it was also not really a complicated case, so interprocedural, we had no issues, and you really nicely can see in the middle that the MR was reduced or less not um, possible anymore. So the cardiac output also increased from 2.7 to 3.2. The last tendon implantation was actually this year in April, and you really nicely can see the core valve, the self-expanding tendon, and in the middle you're going to see that there is no MR uh, left over. So. Um, what is actually more interesting is how are the gonna patients dealing with. So the first case was actually just on Friday, had her clinical visit. Um, so it's two and a half years now from there. You really can see in the echo there's no MR. There's a P-mean of three millimeter mercury. The Tarvi has just a minimal PVL. Um, the ejection fraction, that is really interesting, actually increases from uh, 45 to 55 almost, and also the right ventricle function increases. As we may be remember, it was a uh, TAPS of 8 millimeter, now it's 21, and the TR actually also reduced. So she's now on a New York Heart Association um, too. The second patient, actually, um, we have seen after six months, and actually also the result was pretty, pretty good. Um, unfortunately, uh, she died uh, after one and a half years after the 10 um, implantation. So, and today, actually, we've seen after six months the third patient, and she's also pretty fine, and everything, all the parameters in the echo increases also the ejection fracture. So, overall, actually, it seems for the three cases that it's durable, it's safety, and we really have good results. And here, uh, Tara Masso actually um, uh, is, um, presented an article which is under press, where we're like, looking at the transepical uh, mitral valve replacement and periaortic valve replacement. And these were 11 consecutive patients. Um, 36 patients were male. We had a main age of 77 years, SCS score of 9, and 50-50 surgical transcatheterotic valve replacement, and the stenosis was 90% and regurgitation 9.1. Um, we also had some anatomically characteristics, so the left ventricle ejection fracture was 51, uh, functional MR was 64%, and the calcification was 91%, um, and we had a new LVOT of 411. So, and that is really the great result, technical success, 100%. Uh, patients on the ICU stayed three days. Uh, we had just one patient that died in 30 years. There were no ECMO requirement, no re-intervention. There was no biopathies, dysfunction, LVT obstruction, excess side problems, myocardial infarction or stroke. We just had like two patients that went under a ballon valvuloplasty and had like a bark to three or four pleading. So the follow-up, one year, you really can see the all-cause mortality was 27%. One patient, as I told, died in the range of 30 days. And no uh, heart failure, rehospitalization, myocardial infarction, stroke, or re-intervention, no dysfunction, and um, actually, so the gradient was 2.6. So, to conclude, the transapical TMVI with 109 is feasible in patients with previously implanted aortic valve prosthesis with same outcomes as in nave anatomy. Important is the pre-procedural pre CT planning, and previous surgical IVR or TRVR does not represent a contraindication to TMVI with 109, especially considering its unique features and retrievability. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for this uh, beautiful presentation. And we have a few more moments uh, for discussion. Still no question from the floor. You're not tired, right? Uh, so maybe I start up with another question, uh, Paul. You showed us this really very impressive data on the first 100 and even some more patients with tendine. Um, how about screening failure? How about um, do, how many patients in, in, in percentage do we have to rule out for, let's say, LVOT obstruction, um, size of the annulus, and whatsoever? So we know that uh, among the patients who are submitted, the screen success rate is about 45%. So what we don't know is we don't know how many would have not been or did, were not submitted. So was it, what's the denominator beyond that? But the screen success rate has actually been quite favorable, and it actually has gotten quite a bit better with the low-profile prosthesis being available. Well, that's very encouraging. Another question from my side would be, you showed us also the one-year mortality rate, which is, c which is close to the one-year mortality rate we just okay. saw a, a few seconds ago, and it was yeah. close to 30%. Uh, could you comment on this, yeah. uh, doing uh, such an elaborate procedure on a patient group, and then you have 30% mortality after one year? Just yeah. No, it, it, I think it's provocative. It, yeah, no, and, it, it, and it's very appropriate because when you look at these, all the transcatheter studies, you know, if you look at their, they all start in the high risk groups, whether it's partner or some other similar study, the one year mortality for these treated patients is around 25 to 30 percent. And it's, a, it's driven by the morbidities. I think we're still very early at trying to decide which patients benefit. It's, it's very hard right now to, to figure that out. You know, I think, you know, earlier we had discussions about COAP and Mitra FR and how that, that's helped a lot. We don't have that for Tendine. We don't know which patients benefit exactly. We have some rough idea about futility, but in terms of the anatomical qualification, we're still, we're, we still have a lot to learn. So it's probably not due to, to tendine failure because you showed also the MR data. Right. They look very impressive. Right. It has to do with some other comorbidities on the right heart side or whatever. Correct. Correct. And, and, and some patients, even despite their elevated function, were not treated with defibrillators, for example. So that, 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 that has been an issue. Um, but you're right. It's not because of the MR and it's not because of dysfunction of prosthesis. It's going to be driven by heart failure, sudden death due to cardiomyopathy, or morbidity that would have increased the surgical risk from the beginning. Also, the standard deviation has been up, and we've seen the compassionate use case with the TAVR prosthesis. These patients were 84, 85, 84. Uh, so there, we have to expect a slightly higher one-year mortality than if we go down to 60 uh, or 70 years of age, I would say. I have a comment in the COAP trial, which was uh, obviously a sicker group of patients. The ejection fraction was average was 30 percent, with a wide range going up to 20. The mortality at one year was only 21 percent. So obviously these are two different subsets. And potentially these patients in Tendine were lower risk than COAP. COAP was actually very high risk. So doesn't it make an observation that what was the STS in COAP? The STS in Tendine was eight. The STS, uh, in the STS was a mixed population because it, I think it was six and seven. So 25% were low risk and then 75% were high risk. But the cutoff for ejection fraction was 20%. We had a bunch of patients whose EF was up to 20%, really low, where the EF is definitely higher in Tendine, much higher. The, 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 the you're correct. The average EF was higher. Forty-five percent. Forty-five percent. Even though EF is not only the uh, not only uh, an important variance, but it is, and still we had a survival of I mean, a pretty good survival. Yeah. Paul, can you also comment for me? You showed the summit trial, but do you personally think that this trial design is a good design? The bar from the co-app is so high. Is there a chance of for tendine? To compete? Well, so, so I've been involved in several redesigns. <laughs> so, and, and originally, you know, we were trying to look at it from the lens of surgery and that, well, this is a prosthesis being put in a transcatheter way instead of a surgical way, so we should compare it against surgery. The problem is, is that there are no guidelines for surgical valve replacement for secondary MR. We, we, they're just, they're, they're, it's not the standard of care. 
And when co-op came out, it established a new standard that you cannot ignore. And, 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 and when you actually look at it, they're actually quite complementary because we know MitralClip, as great as it is, it can't take care of all the MR, whereas Tendine can take care of all the MR, but it's a prosthesis. So we're going to learn uh, which one, hopefully, is, is, is what the benefits of each and how they complement each other. Can you tell us a little bit about the anti-thrombotic regimen Absolutely. when you use the uh, yeah. Tendine? So it's a good question, because uh, in the beginning, um, the first 50 patients or so, there, there, there was no uh, anti-thrombotic regimen. And we did see thrombus on a few patients. Uh, we did ma then mandated Coumadin for six months and have not had an issue since. And you know, other trials that are ongoing actually copied uh, the Tendine uh, protocol in terms of that and also have not had an issue. Um, we are more Excuse me, yeah. go ahead. I just want to say we are more stronger because we have seen thrombosis. So actually, ERNR of uh, 3.0, 2.5, we're not right. stopping after six months. Uh, so they are on our anticoagulation. So I think you know the major issue is actually the transepical access at the end. So I think to performing the procedure is not an issue at all. But later on, you know, with the anticoagulation, I think this is what we have to come over and find a good way actually um, also for the patients because if you talk to them they are kind of happy that they are not anymore on, on warfarin or whatever and can take NOACs and then you tell them you know what if you want this prosthesis you need warfarin and so they are sometimes a little bit concerned about that so um, I think this is kind of uh, in my opinion the biggest issue with with the procedures. Uh, they, have to be, Go ahead. Uh, they have to be concerned because bleeding rate is going to be exceedingly high. This is a very elderly patient population. And by the way, I don't see any issue putting this patient on a NOAC after, let's say, three months or so because it's a bioprosthesis. It's not has nothing to do with the ALIGN study with, with the Dabigatran in mechanical prosthesis. So I, I, I would at least entertain this, this idea. But if you understood correctly, you both use vitamin K antagonists. You for six months, then you s and that's a monotherapy, and then you switch them to nothing or no, a platelet. No, we completely uh, you continue. You continue and Paul, you yeah. any any platelet with Coumadin yeah. or okay. vitamin K antagonists. Yeah. So and yeah, but in your experience, after these six months, you didn't see any issues. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I guess I would. I, I actually listening to you. I actually completely agree. We if the patient's doing well, we just leave them on it. You know, and, and that's something that we discuss with each patient. And but we do give them the option at, after six months. And yeah. what do you think there's going to be a challenge in enrollment where you know that the MitraClip doesn't need, first of all, it's safer, it's transeptal, it's, uh, it's a one day stay, and you don't even need anything. You probably don't even need aspirin. You right? love MitraClips, right? <laughs> no, no, I, I just don't love it. I'm just yeah. being just practical. If I'm a patient, I have to be told it's going to be through the venous stick. You'll go home tomorrow morning, and you can just take aspirin for six months. Well, Saibal, as oh, you we, know, there, we, are, yeah. there are patients that cannot be treated with a mitriclip. No, I no, think, yeah. but in the trial, they have to be, they have yeah, to be treated by alpha. both. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. the problem. But let's wait and see for the data, for the comparison. <laughs> So, Paul, you showed uh, some cases of MAC, and I think that's clearly an unmet yeah, yeah. need where we cannot uh, have satisfactory results with uh, the uh, MITRI clip. Uh, I think you showed a very nice, uh, sizable series already. Uh, what about uh, uh, residual mitral regurgitation? Is it as good as in, in other yeah. valve settings? So, it's been, I mean, it, honestly, I showed you the, the very fir first case we did, and we actually had a lot of naysayers. A lot of people were really hesitant about doing this, and we were shocked. And, and we have been, we continue to be shocked 19 patients later. I mean, it really is quite surprising. And I think it has to do with the anatomical configuration. And, and the company has done a marvelous job of giving us the sizing that's needed. And, you know, if you look at what other prostheses are doing, and I don't have to name them, but they're, they're, they're distending the annulus in ways that that calcification isn't going to be as friendly to distend, whereas we're allowed to true size, which makes, I think, a, a much better difference. So this is certainly a very promising outlook. I think the lights go up yeah. in the indication That's that we sign, should end right? our uh, discussion. I want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists uh, and speakers for the excellent presentation, my co-chair, and wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you.